What's up guys, Stole Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. So this is Mustard, and this is Why French Trains Are the Fastest. Uh, so yeah, we watched the TGV, I think is what it was called. It was the world record for the fastest train. I can't remember exactly how fast it went, but it was it was quick. It was gone by in like a split second. Uh, yeah, I'm imagining it has something to do with the regulations, right? That's going to be a huge factor. Uh, but anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. In 1981, these are the fastest trains in the world. But French engineers want to see just how fast they can go. Reaching 380 kilometers an hour, the TGV smashes past the world record that's held for over 25 years. The French have something to prove, because 40 years ago, amid controversy and doubt, this train took on the plane and won. Only a few decades earlier, it seemed that trains had reached their limit. In experimental runs, railway engineers had pushed them to incredible speeds. But in actual service, trains around the world weren't anywhere near as fast, nor were they getting any faster. In the 1950s, they ran at about the same speeds as they did in the 1930s. The problem was, engineering a faster locomotive would only get you so far. With many rail lines Cost having been built a half century earlier, they had sharp curves, steep grades to climb, and outdated signaling that just couldn't handle higher speeds. Getting trains to go faster would mean having to rebuild the tracks they ran. Oh yeah, that's definitely cost prohibitive. I didn't even think of the signage and stuff, but yeah, like all the railway crossings and stuff, you got a train going through at like 200 plus miles per hour. You're going to have to warn people a long time before that train gets there, right? Because they're just going to get destroyed in a split second. Ran on, which was not only expensive, many were convinced it was pointless because the 1960s was the dawn of the jet age. Air travel offered unparalleled speed, while the automobile promised unmatched freedom and convenience. The train was no match for either. Around the world, billions were spent building new superhighways, short-haul air routes were growing in popularity, and just around the corner, new technologies and radical transport solutions promised to reshape travel entirely. Many saw trains Commercial jets capable of short vertical or short or vertical takeoff and landings were advocated for by the French administration of civil aviation. That's interesting because, like, obviously you have that now in a lot of jets, like fighter planes and stuff. But I, I don't think there's anything that has it in a uh, in a commercial aviation, not to my knowledge, at least. As an antiquated 19th century technology, but halfway around the world, the Japanese were about to change everything. When everyone else had given up on railways, the Japanese had just completed one of the most ambitious rail projects of the century. Building more than 500 kilometers of near perfectly straight track, tunneling through mountains, and constructing over a thousand bridges. The Japanese called it the Shinkansen. And when it opened in 1964, the trains on this new railway ran at over 200 kilometers per hour faster than anywhere in the world. The Shinkansen was a new kind of railway, one reserved exclusively for high-speed trains. Taking the most direct route possible, it cut the travel time between Japan's two largest cities in half. But it wasn't just its speed that was impressive, it was the scale. The Shinkansen could move a huge volume of people. A single train carried nearly a thousand passengers and over 120 trains ran every single day, oh, one damn. every 15 minutes. In just the first three years, the Shinkansen moved more than 100 million passengers, and two cities located nearly 500 kilometers apart were seemingly pulled closer together. But as the world looked on in admiration, railway engineers in France were dismayed. The French were no strangers to getting their trains to go fast. Only a few years earlier, French engineers had set a remarkable train speed record, putting themselves at the forefront of railway technology. In areas of acceleration, braking, and electric pickup at high speeds, 
They were world leaders, but none of that seemed to matter, because the top brass running France's railways, the SNCF, lacked vision. Facing record deficits, they were obsessed with short-term fixes, cutting costs, reducing service, and closing down rail lines. But the opening of the, and the thing with all these short-term fixes, you see this so much in the government, right? Short-term solutions to everything, and a lot of this has to do with elections, right? Uh, it's kind of one of the downfalls of democracy. Lots of benefits, one of the downfalls, everyone's only worried about the next election, which means how much can we make ourselves look good in these four years? If we win, we'll worry about the next four years later, or five years, or whatever it is for, you know, your country. And if we lose, we can just blame it on the next guy when shit fucks up and we can get into power afterwards, right? It's, uh, the short-term thinking is so annoying. It, it's kind of unavoidable in a democratic system, um, but it's still so annoying. The Shinkansen sparked a profound shift in thinking. Up until then, the fastest trains in France had almost always been luxurious trains, scheduled to run maybe once or twice a day with all first-class seating and expensive fares. But the Japanese had shown how speed and frequency were commodities that could be sold to an eager public. And that got them thinking. In the preceding years, French domestic air travel had exploded in popularity, a trend that was only expected to continue. But the irony was that an ever-increasing share of the time flying to a destination was actually spent on the ground, stuck on congested roads or in crowded airports. Turns out, going faster didn't always mean saving time. Man, the funny thing is, this is still true. I, I haven't been on a plane in a couple of years, but I remember the last time I was on one, it was either, I was going to Cuba or Mexico. And it's actually not, the funny thing is, it's not bad when you're in the Cuban airports, right? They're, you know, remarkably um, easy to get out of and easy to get into. Uh, but, you know, in the Canadian airport, at least, you would to be there, like, an hour, maybe two hours before, uh, just to get on the plane. And then, you know, it's a three hour flight. Like you're, you're spending almost as much time in the air, but once you get to Cuba, I mean, you're just off and gone. Or once you're, you're you know, when you're in Cuba waiting to load up, it's just, you know, on and gone. But, uh, yeah, in, in, in Canada, at least it's, oh my God, this is a pain. And the SNCF could use that to their advantage. At distances of up to a thousand kilometers, a high-speed train scheduled to run frequently could go head-to-head -head with the airplane. And if it was made affordable, it could win back passengers. Within months, SNCF went on the offensive with a bold plan for high-speed point-to-point connections between major cities. But where the Japanese had spent enormous sums building an entirely new rail network right down to all new stations, that wasn't going to work for the French. SNCF would have to keep costs down, utilizing as much of their existing network as possible. Instead, they'd focus their efforts on developing a new kind of train, experimenting with locomotives powered by gas turbines taken straight from military helicopters. Using aircraft technology had a few key advantages. Gas turbines were light and powerful, and they would allow trains to run on steeper grades, so tracks could be built with fewer tunnels and bridges and kerosene-fueled gas turbines would eliminate the need to build expensive overhead lines. And the French were prepared to take it a step further than the Japanese, aiming for dramatically higher speeds. In 1972, SNCF unveiled the TGV-001, an experimental train with cutting-edge technologies and a top speed of more than 300 kilometers per hour. This was a train designed to sell high-speed rail to a skeptical public. World-renowned designer Jacques Cooper was hired to design a train that didn't look like a train. Taking inspiration from his earlier work on sports cars, Cooper gave the TGV bold, sleek lines that were undeniably cool. Gone were the opulent rail cars of earlier French Express trains, replaced with modern aircraft-like cabins. Gas turbines produced an impressive 5,000 horsepower and powered electric motors that drove each of the train's wheels. Articulated bogies reduced weight, improved stability, and offered a smooth, quieter ride. In testing, the prototype racked up over half a million kilometers and accelerated beyond 300 kilometers per hour more than 175 times. 
Oh, Just about anyone with political sway was invited to ride the train of the future and hear SNCF's vision for high-speed rail. With proven technology, the French were on the verge of putting the world's fastest train into service. But many leaders wanted nothing to do with the TGV. There were fears that it would be a Concorde on rails, another massively expensive vanity project without hope of ever turning a profit. Others dismissed it as benefiting the wealthy, with new lines skipping past the smaller cities to serve the Paris elite. And there were still competing visions for the future of French transport. The era but I don't know, skipping past smaller cities is necessarily, you know, for the elite, right? That's for the most amount of people. If it was going to smaller cities, I think you'd have an argument, more so of an argument that it was serving the elite, right? If it's going to like some seaside villa that only rich people go to, it's like, oh yeah, this is obviously serving the elite. But when it's going to your, your major urban centers throughout your country, right? Like take the United States, for example. If you had a, if you had a trade that went from like Boston to New York to Washington, D.C., um, you know, all up the East Coast, all the biggest cities, when I went to Chicago, Detroit, uh, you know, across to, you know, California, just hit your major population centers, right? Only areas with like a population of above like five or 10 million, as opposed to one that, you know, goes to like the Hamptons and Big Bear and like all of these people that are known for like, you know, wealthy people going and vacationing at. It's a little bit of a difference, big difference. Aerotrain, a radical track hovercraft that ran on an elevated concrete guideway, was also making headlines. With a promised speed of over 400 kilometers an hour, it stole some of the TGV's thunder and gained considerable support. It's a weird looking Meanwhile, vehicle. the Civil Aviation Administration pushed for the development of airliners capable of short takeoff and landings and even the construction of compact runways right in the center of Paris. Support for the TGV wasn't anywhere near what the SNC have hoped for, and things would only get worse. In 1973, the price of oil began to skyrocket, rising nearly 300% in a single year. Oil exporting nations in the Middle East had imposed an embargo on the West, sending shockwaves throughout the global economy and causing widespread fuel shortages. France was among the worst hit, where almost three quarters of the country's energy needs depended on imported oil. After years of development, SNCF found itself having gone all in on fuel-thirsty gas turbines, right as the era of cheap oil was ending. But for the TGV, the energy crisis would turn out to be a blessing in disguise. In 1974, the French Prime Minister launched an ambitious plan to meet the country's energy needs with nuclear power, pledging to build over 150 nuclear plants under the slogan, in France, we do not have oil, but we have ideas. For SNCF, the decision was a game changer. They began working on an electric version of the TGV. Switching from gas turbine to electric traction was a huge undertaking calling for the development of new pentagraphs, suspension and braking systems. But French railway engineers, who had a history of pushing electric locomotives to their limits, managed to complete the modifications in just two years. And the switch from gas to electric would soon pay off in a big way. Cars, airliners and aerotrains depended on imported oil, while the TGV could run on French nuclear energy. The optics were powerful. But the energy crisis also forced leaders to prioritize public transport. And by March 1976, the necessary approvals were in place for the construction of a new line connecting France's two largest cities. And it would largely be paid for with private capital, not government subsidies. Soon, large swaths of countryside bore witness to a massive construction project, the first major Western European rail line in nearly half a century. With a sleek new look for the 1980s, the TGV was set to debut as the fastest train in the world. But just months before opening in 1981, French railway engineers would do what they did best, find out just how fast they could go. In a highly publicized event, they pushed the TGV well beyond its initial operating speed, all the way up to 380 kilometers per hour, smashing the world oh, record man. they had set decades earlier. But while the 1955 record had pushed railway technology to its literal breaking point, 
380 kilometers per hour was achieved with the very same train that would soon go into service, paving the way for even higher speeds in the future. From its opening in September 1981, the success of the TGV surprised even the SNCF. Only two months after opening, it had already carried its millionth passenger. And within a year, France's largest domestic airline saw a 60% decline in passengers between Paris and Lyon. Many of the public's criticisms faded as the price of a ticket wasn't any higher than on a regular train. And an aggressive marketing campaign promoted the TGV's efficiency, time savings, and accessibility. And as if on cue, politicians who had vehemently opposed the TGV in the 1960s and 70s now proudly proclaimed their support for it all along. <laughs> Almost immediately, SNCF... The classic political thing. Oh my god, that, it's so irritating. You see that today too. I've talked about this before, but probably the most famous example I can think about this in my lifetime is the Iraq War, right? Where now everyone did, everyone wants to claim that they were against the Iraq War and they've always been against the Iraq War. And you see this with both politicians and people. Meanwhile, if you look at the data from back at the time that it happened, it had something like a 92, 94% approval rating among the public and pretty much every politician. The only one I can think of was... Uh, was it Rand Paul? Whichever the older Paul is. I can't remember if it's Rand or... Um, I think it's Rand Paul. But uh, yeah, the the older Paul, he was against it, and everyone else was for it. And I think Bernie might have been against it too, but pretty much every politician was for it, right? 90-plus percent of the public was for it. Now everyone is always talking about, like, oh, yeah, I was never for the Iraq War. It's like, fuck off. You all were. <laughs> so irritating began to plan for new lines connecting more French cities. Over the years, service speeds also increased, and in experimental runs, French railway engineers continued to push the limit, God ultimately damn, reaching 574 kilometers an hour in 2007, God damn. a railway speed record that holds to this day. Like the Shenkensen, the TGV was an immediate technical and commercial success, and by the mid-1980s, it had become a symbol of national pride a nearly two-decade-old vision that had finally been confirmed. The train had taken on the plane and won. And as a testament to the forward thinking of railway engineers, today, high-speed rail is more relevant than ever. The 1991 Gulf War was a defining moment in modern warfare, a showcase of advanced military technology on a massive scale. And in the opening hours of the conflict, Iraq commanded the fourth largest military in the world, with an air force of nearly 700 combat-ready aircraft. Among these... It's interesting that they bring up the Iraq War right after I talk about it. Oh, this, is, this is not the same Iraq War, right? This is the Gulf War, but... Uh, uh, interesting that it was brought up right after I was talking about it. It was the Soviet-built MiG-25 Foxbat. A Cold War-era interceptor that by many accounts was too heavy, too unmaneuverable, and too outdated to put up much of a fight. But the Iraqis would push the aircraft to its limit, leveraging any advantage they could find in a daring plan to ambush state-of-the-art American F-15s as they patrolled the skies over Baghdad. The outcome wasn't what anyone would have expected. What's this got to do with trains? I'm interested. You can learn more about the incredible Samura air battle in my latest video, now on Nebula. Uh, Nebula is home to a growing number of exclusive me. mustard videos. Whether it's the stories behind iconic machines or bringing unrealized concepts to life. And it's where you can expect to see a lot more exciting projects in the near future including reimagining what the world would have looked like if mass supersonic air travel had become reality. But you might be asking, why are these videos only on Nebula? On YouTube, algorithms influence which videos you see, and advertisers restrict the type of content that creators can make. Nebula is not like YouTube, and that fundamentally changes- Honestly, the advertiser is restricting content. It's true, and it's so irritating because what oh god it's so annoying it's like let people watch they want to watch and throw your fucking ads on it just like oh they're so worried about like these stupid special interest groups and these karens and stuff that are gonna 
you know, Colin harassed them. Like, why is Coca-Cola sponsoring Jake Paul? It's like, fuck off. Just let people watch what they want to watch. Changes how I make videos. On Nebula, I can make a video as long as it needs to be. The videos only have to make mustard viewers happy, not a general audience, which is what the YouTube algorithm demands. And that means I can cover fascinating technical details in more depth, bring lesser known concepts to life, that or experiment really with entirely new formats. There's no algorithm, there's only you. But there's one other very important difference. Nebula is owned directly by us, the creators. There's no one else to answer to, and we're not lining someone else's pockets. And that means your support goes directly into funding more high quality projects that otherwise would have never been made. When you sign up for Nebula, you also get access to Nebula classes, where you can even take entire courses on how to become a creator yourself. Sign up using the link below and you'll get a $20 discount, meaning for just $2.50 a month, you'll support Mustard. And in return, you'll get access to tons of new premium content from your favorite creators. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I honestly kind of makes me want to check out more of his videos. The f like some of the stuff that he was, uh, yeah, talking about there is really, really interesting. Some of the the just the the concept artwork looks really interesting to me. But yeah, the, the YouTube's advertising rules are so irritating sometimes, and uh, it's so annoying. But it is what it is. Yeah, I definitely think we need to start focusing on more of this stuff in North America, too. I don't think we need it as much as the Europeans. And, and like, it really irritates me when fucking you hear these dipshit European takes of, like, how travel should work in the Americas. It's like, you guys don't realize how expansive and empty this continent is. Like, a lot of what you're suggesting is just not, not financially viable. But I do think we need to start incorporating some of this stuff, especially in certain areas, like, along... Uh, the east, right, in, in Canada, the United States, where there's, like, a lot of population density. Along the west, where there's a lot of population density. And then certain core areas in the uh, the Midwest and, and the south and stuff. But, um, yeah, Canada especially. I, I feel like one of the th – if Canada wants to deal with the housing crisis, I feel like one of the big things we need to do is have a – start building houses up north and start having a high-speed rail to bring people in f from, you know – there the, for the daily commute because there's people already doing hour or two hour daily commutes what's the difference if it's on a train um you know ship them up north have them live like what would be four or five six hours seven hours up north and by car it's two hours on one of these trains you fucking send them to toronto in 45 minutes to an hour two hours maybe it's you know Seems like a lot more reasonable, especially with how useless that land is for farming. So one of the big problems we have in Ontario is, you know, the place where everyone wants to live is also the only place where it's really viable farmland, right? But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.